41 cases on the 30th of March 2020. Uh, Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi went under partial lockdown as directed by the President of Ghana, His Excellency Nanado Dankwa Ekufu Ado. Exactly three weeks down the line, uh, with a record case of about 1,042, uh, the president has lifted the ban on, you know, uh, well, has lifted the lockdown, basically. And so the question that many are asking is that what is the science behind the lifting of the lockdown, knowing very well that our cases are increasing? And looking at other countries, it looks like it could get worse. And so we could be in for some serious, serious situation. But at the same time, we want to find out from you what you think as well. This is COVID-19 360, and we're here to give you an update on everything that's happening as usual, not only in Ghana, but the rest of the world. My name is Bella Mundi. Well, and I am Anita Ikir Kofu. And like Bella rightly mentioned, the ban on the lockdown or partial lockdown in some parts of Greater Accra, Greater Kumasi, Kaswa and Tema have been lifted. And yesterday, social media was on fire, Bella. Yes, a lot was. of people are not too excited about it. Some are also a little bit worried about some of the consequences this might pose. And this morning, um, trying to monitor, you know, our sister stations and what is happening in other regions as well. Kumasi is worse. Yeah, it is. They've thrown social distance into the wolves and it, it is non-existent, if I should say that. And yeah. I'm a little worried as well, looking at how we're progressing. And I don't really think Ghanaians at this point really? have really absorbed what we've been trying to preach. Well, I'm not a little worried. I'm very worried, very. extremely <laughs> worried, because, again, I'm um, having a discussion this morning with a historian professor. He mentioned that, you know, we haven't had enough time to educate the masses. We were still waiting for the translation in the local languages. We understand that, um, you know, the Ministry of Information had taxed the, um, you know, Bureau of, you know, local languages to come up with eight different translations in different languages. And even that we have not, or we are yet to experience it, and the lockdown has been lifted. A lot of people believe that it's probably because governments cannot again um, afford keeping people at home because it's costing government a lot and also a few people think it's all because of elections politics I've, and I've, heard, I've that. heard that side yeah. as well yeah yeah and so that's why they have lifted the lockdown we'll be speaking to a number of people today to ask a lot of questions all the questions that you're asking security wise what does it mean and we'll be speaking to uh mr adam uh pardon me so adib sani and he will be telling us what he thinks about it as well so we'll just cross over to him real quick and after that we'll continue the conversation good morning to you sir and thank you so much for joining us how are you doing very well bella how yeah are you doing? i'm fine thank you now you mentioned that you know the president's decision to lift the lockdown was pointless why do you say so well it is pointless on the heel of the warning by the world health organization that um, africa is likely to be the epicenter of um, the new cases that are expected. Um, indeed, a UN panel also indicated that um, if care is not taken, a lot more people will be driven into poverty on the continent. Mm. Um, it has been you know, said by experts all across the world that this, look, this is global, a global pandemic. Uh -huh. And to be able to deal with it needs a global uh, response. Yeah. And so whatever we do at the local level, even though we have some few exceptions, should be consistent with the international response. And across the world, and even on the African continent, we have a lot of countries that are extending the lockdown, and in some cases, even making it stricter based on certain indices, okay? And mm -hmm. one of the commonest is the flattening of the curve. Currently, yeah. perhaps as a result of the fact that per capita, we are number one when it comes to testing. So yeah. obviously, uh, the, the persons uh, infected, the numbers would keep rising. So until we are certain that the number is no longer rising, then we can say there's a flattening of the curve. However, that should be in the midst of a continuous, rigorous and rigorous testing regime. Mm -hmm. okay? And would be comfortable enough to say, okay, let us reduce re the restrictions imposed. And in some countries, the, the lifting of lockdowns is not done this way. Mm. Okay, it is done in phases. Yeah. Okay, let us start with uh, persons within the automobile industry. Okay, let us start with the civil servants faced in such in that fashion. But when you ask that 
the lockdown be lifted completely and people can go about their daily activities, that could pose a much more serious issue to us as a country. And in the near future, we might start seeing a lockdown so simplistic mm -hmm. as having been the best thing to do. Okay, so my problem is usually your actions and inactions doesn't produce immediate resu results. It's, okay. it, 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 it simmers for some time. What is happening in New York is not because of the bad decisions or judgments made about a week ago, but months ago. Mm. So if you don't take the right decisions today, in the near future, you might be confronted with a much more serious issue that would require you to take more or further drastic measures that you never fathomed you take. So my fear is if we don't put the right structures in place, especially the lockdown, which is the surest bet, bet for many countries, our healthcare delivery system, which Bella, I must indicate, mm -hmm. life support machine itself, would be tested. Yeah. And that would be catastrophic. And I'm not sure we would want to reach that stage. This is common sense. You don't need to be a professor emeritus in health to be able to tell that if you don't put these protocols in place, you might be confronted with a much more dire situation than you can have. But talking, talking about protocols, I mean, yesterday the president spoke extensively on some of the achievements that we have talked. And you'd see that it's been summarized, um, you know, um, online into seven reasons why the president, you know, gave the, the reasons why he lifted the lockdown. Now, I'm sure that he had a thorough understanding of how the virus operates, basically, and also is surrounded by experts. And so don't you think that they all came together, thought of why they need to lift the lockdown, and probably understood that maybe it won't pose a much greater risk than we believe it could? Well, I do appreciate the depth of knowledge um, the experts possess, because I'm not sure these are people sourced from Makola Market. They are people with immense skills and experience in health mm. and definitely whatever advice they would give to the president should be in the best interest of the state mm. however they are humans mistakes are made um, we were in this country when mistakes were made and you see the number of people who made the mistake and their credentials and it's amazing mm. okay so i mean let us not make it look like they are the pinnacle of all knowledge okay. okay they have to source information from as many stakeholders as possible mm -hmm. so in the end we all have we, we would all have a role to play in um, contributing towards combating the, the disease okay okay so I feel that look this lifting of the lockdown is a bit premature okay. um, we, we could have done it at a later st stage, not now. Not because now, okay. The, no, not now, because the fear is you might still have the community infection happening. Uh, it, it, a lot of tests is definitely happening. And uh, 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 the fact that there's no lockdown would mean people going about their daily activities. And what is worrying is the fact that you cannot have all Ghanaians at all times agreeing on everything okay mm. so you definitely have some who would not you know uh, 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 respect the social distancing protocols the president is banking his hopes on okay. okay and the question also is to what extent are we going to enforce these protocols are the security agencies capacitated enough to enforce it have they collaborated or partnered uh, pro progressively with the judiciary mm -hmm. so cases brought before them are expeditiously dealt with have they gone out there to the hinterlands to engage the people especially through the information service department and of course the national commission for civic education that i must say have been staffed of resources for far too long mm. have engaged community leaders enough because look this cannot be done by the government or the executive or even the security agencies alone it needs a collaborated, concerted effort by all, especially the people. To what extent have we engaged the people? And okay. I speak as a communications person myself. The focus has been what, when, where, okay, or why. Yeah. But we have not given credence to the how, because there are still a lot of Ghanaians who are below the poverty line. 
Okay, there are still a lot of Ghanaians who attend living in a single room. Which is which is probably why. I mean, talking about the economy, let's look at China and how the, their economy was greatly affected. Their GDP shrank uh, by 6.8%, okay? And this is the worst um, in a long time. Now, let's look at Ghana as well, where it's been projected that our GDP is going to drop. Uh, our growth rate is going to be about 1.5%. And so don't you think that... Based on the economy and how we're going to suffer, the president and his team thought that, well, we might as well also do something to protect the economy so that we don't move from uh, the achievements we've chalked to ground zero again. Well, I've been following the economics of it. Indeed, the World Bank has stated that um, a lot of um, economies uh, would, would definitely we'll shrink. Yeah. Uh, shrink. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time in quarter of a century, we have seen growth reduce in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. But the only economy that is likely to still, you know, carry on is China, which would grow at a rate of about 5%. But it's also been predicted that next year, we will see the global economy bounce back and bounce back big. Mm. Okay. I think the president was caught between a balance, you know, um, economy and of health. Okay. I do appreciate and do commiserate with the Ghanaians who cannot afford, who cannot eat when they don't step out. Mm -hmm. But let us also, let me also add that this is not affecting only the poor. It is affecting the rich. I know people who run uh, hotels who have asked their 100 man staff to go, yeah, home, to go home because they can't pay mm -hmm. them. So you can imagine the trickle down effect. This mm -hmm. would have rippling and told economic social hardship on Ghanaians. But like I always say, we are in desperate times. We all are affected. I speak as a businessman myself. I'm losing a lot of money on daily basis. Mm -hmm. If I were to take it from the self-centered angle or perspective, I would be the last person to advocate a lockdown. However, this is something we all have to inconvenience ourselves for in the best interest of public safety okay. and of course public health. Mm. Okay. Um, however we can mitigate the effects on especially the poor by instituting social you know, safety nets, uh, by collaborating with other stakeholders like philanthropists and even organizations who, I must say, have been doing a great job mm. since the end of the lockdown in Ghana. If we do that, I'm sure, and follow certain protocols, we can get people as many as possible fed. All right. Jesus. All right. Thank you so much, Adib Sani, for speaking to us. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we hope to speak to you again another time. He's a security analyst and the executive director for Jati K Center for Human Security and Peace Building. Now we'll move on and speak to Sebastian Eugene Arthur, who is a virologist, and he's joining us on phone. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's good to have you. But first of all, I want to understand. Do you think it was a bad decision by the president uh, to call off the lockdown? Well, I think um, we can look at this in two ways. Uh, one of the ways which I think um, is wise to do. I think the president has made a decision and um, is backed by uh, evidence um, from numbers, right? Statistics. Mm. So, uh, to me, it's a good decision. Now, the other side, most people are complaining about it being a bad decision. And I think, for the most part, it's because of um, people comparing, you know, Ghana to Italy, Ghana to U.S., Ghana to all the other countries that are suffering severe um, um, situations, you know. Um, one of those organizations has given guidelines as to what we have to do, you know, before we can look at them. Mm. Um, one is transmission control. So you have to be sure that your transmission is controlled. The question is, do we have transmission control in Ghana? My answer is somehow. Now, this is why I say somehow. Okay. Whatever we have right now, whatever numbers we have right now, is something that we have gotten from a test we want to do voluntarily. Now, if we have waited in the hospitals, in all our clinics and all that, to just have people come to the court, Mm -hmm. I don't think you really have cases. Remember, most of the um, uh, cases from the 124 uh, or uh, 42 are people who are asymptomatic, which means that they will not even come to the hospital or think about taking medical attention. Now, mm -hmm. we have a three week ban, which means that if we really were closed down in our houses or in our local areas, then within that three weeks, if you really have symptoms, you will manifest and you will report it. Okay. If you are being honest. So now,
now that we would not have any severe issue where people were calling in, you know, coming to check and we get samples. That's where we can say, okay, the issue is increasing. Transmission is ongoing. Now, this is where we are actually taking the cases from a localized area or places where people are locked down. So mm. the transmission is ongoing. I don't know if you, if you get the point. But it's okay. not ongoing from the data we have. All now, right. Another thing is, why did we actually institute this lockdown? The thing is to make sure that our healthcare system is not incapacitated. And when I say that, I mean, we don't, we don't really want to wait. Just more cases, and then we come, uh, you know, like a lot of people to just go about their daily activities, the um, transmission goes, you know, between us and then most people are sick. That is where our healthcare system will be overwhelmed because most people need healthcare um, uh, facilities to be able okay. to contain their symptoms and all that. So, so that's now it. that we are locked down, we have thousands and forty two people, mm -hmm. most of whom are um, um, uh, asymptomatic. Those who are symptomatic, they will go to the hospital. The number is so low so that our healthcare system can take care of them. Now, in the future, the person says that they have visited places and then um, set aside certain places for testing, testing, and um, the last one was, uh, was uh, what the last one? Uh, testing, tracing, and the last one was, anyway, treating. So mm -hmm. we have plenty for that. We have capacity for that. So yes, we can go ahead and open the system so people can go about their daily activities. However, remember, it yeah. is only the lockdown that is removed. Only the lockdown that is removed. I've stated this and I'll say it again that we have to follow the necessary precautions in place. If you don't have anything to do in town, the lockdown still should be with you, not the government. It should be with you. For but, instance, I don't have anything to do in town. I'm hurt. I don't have okay. to move about. You know, if you have to go to work, the face mask is necessary. Okay. But, but if you're, think if you're are saying... Place, and therefore, the lockdown shouldn't be a problem to most of us. Okay, but if you're saying that, you know, the onus lies on us as individuals to protect ourselves. Now, first of all, the conversation has started about um, us not being able to reach the masses by translating into the local languages. We were yet to even see that rollout from government, uh, from the Bureau of National Languages as well. Now, that is yet to hit the masses who need to really understand how severe the issue is so they can protect themselves. And you clearly saw what happened yesterday. It may not be majority of us, but you saw people jubilating and dancing, and they threw um, you know, the, the social distancing protocol to the cab. So really, if you're saying it's up to us, and we have not been able to educate the masses as much, how then do we protect ourselves now that the lockdown has been lifted? That is a very good question, Bella. Um, let me let me just also reiterate what I've been saying all the time that I don't I really have a problem with our announcement of mm. um, those public discussions. Okay, this is because at first before we say anything, we have to make sure we educate the masses mm -hmm. as to what to do when this is set. So very good to this point. I actually have it written down here, and then I'll be saying it anywhere I go that. Before we say anything, I don't know if Kogia Tonkoma Honorable will be listening to me. Yeah. Before we come out to say anything, we have to make sure that the public understands exactly what it is. Because when the lockdown was initially mentioned, when students were asked to go home, you saw what happened at the beaches. They were mm -hmm. late, they were dancing, they were moving about. They don't really get the logic behind a lockdown. They don't get the logic behind social distancing. We don't even understand what a mask is and what it is used for. Yeah. yeah, and I will, uh, sorry, but I, I'm very blunt. Our minister, the way they use the mask when you look at uh, parliament and proceedings, you know, these are some of the things that we need to actually educate the public on before we allow certain things to, uh, to, to be effective. So, for instance, lockdown is lifted. What about all other things? The president stated them that, remember, he just mentioned them, no one was able to explain every detail of what he said. And mm -hmm. this has to be done. Now, my NGO, Vacation Initiatives in Science, Africa, we deal with infectious disease science with children. And we are willing to actually go out there and train new people, I mean, educated, non educated, about the rules that are set in place to help us to combat this disease. Mm -hmm. I don't know if someone is going to take us on, but if we get opportunity, that is what we want to do. Educate people on what has been said. Most people have about coronavirus, they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. you know, some people have not been taught how to go. We know there's a disease going on. Someone said, I think part of the area will be other. I mean, you know, these are some of the things that we need to really look into. We need to talk about. Yeah. When you come out there and take rules and regulations, fair enough, we don't really understand. No. Okay. Now, now, talking about how Ghana is managing the situation, 
I mean, of course, from judging from the way the president spoke, it looked like it was a speech of success in terms of managing the situation and doing contact tracing. Because now we're the what number one country in Africa that's doing the most tests as per one million of the population as well. And so what could we be doing that works for us? I mean, aside contact tracing and making sure that we reach, um, you know, we, we are ahead of the virus. What else could we be doing that is working for us? Hence the reason for lifting the lockdown. I think the first thing we actually did right was um, the border closure, okay, and uh, we tried to maintain uh, it close as much as possible and the quarantine. Now, the reason why I said that, that is, uh, is when you look at counties like UK and South Africa and all the other counties, the lockdown came late, okay. Ghana, Ghana did well. We came, someone, someone will argue that we came late, but it was actually earlier than most of the counties. So the amount of cases in the county that were pre-existing were very low, you know, and that is why we didn't see anything. And trust me, some people are saying that we might have cases in there. The contact tracing and the surveillance we did, the regular surveillance we did, uh, the uh, uh, intensive, you know, screening of people, were two things that were very important to mm. help them act contain this disease. I'm not saying it contained totally, and I'm not saying the virus is gone from Ghana, but mm -hmm. I'm saying that it has been minimized with this kind of um, procedure put in place. Remember, again, I'm saying that we have three weeks. Now, the virus has an incubation period of between 3 to 14 days, which, by which time you should be showing some symptoms. And if it is severe, people will have reported. Now, once we are home, you have an extra week to, uh, for the virus, to, uh, the system to take care of the virus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Asymptomatic patients cannot go more than three weeks without showing anything. It's either the, 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 the body took care of it totally, or you have some severe case coming up eventually. But with that duration, I don't think anyone can show any symptoms if you had the virus before the lockdown. So these are some of the things we did. The lockdown was very good for us. Okay. The virus was excellent, and our contact tracing was on point. Mm. Okay, now let's talk about the face mask because I remember we had a conversation with you about the use of the face mask and you weren't too keen on it, especially because you said that, you know, it depends on how well people use it. I mean, knowledge about the use of face mask is key. At this point where the president is asking us to make sure that we wear our face mask each time we step out and also adhere to social distancing, what advice do you have for Ghanaians before we wrap up on this conversation? Yeah, I'm um, sure. Um, face masks should be used once um, you want to go out there. Um, we said that a couple of people who should be using the face mask uh, regardless. I think everyone has to use a face mask if you are going out there. Again, the virus is still under study. So um, face mask is really relevant. And um, before you use a face mask, please uh, make sure that what you are having is appropriate. The question is what is appropriate? I would ask that uh, we get in touch with the FDA to come and give us advice. However, I was doing some research on uh, CDC US to see what it, uh, re re uh, I mean, recommended. So they suggested that if you want to do your own mask from home with our material, you just select the, uh, the material uh, and then it to a sunlight or maybe light in the house. And then look through. If you see much of the light penetrating, it is a no-no. But if you see less light, like very low light going through, it is okay. Now that the word is okay, I didn't say it's excellent. Because what is actually appropriate to be used is what the doctor must use. And there will be so much pressure on it. If you want to use that, if you have at home, you can use this simple method. First of all, look the material to the light and okay. see how much light goes through. Just look through and see how much light goes through. Okay. And um, if it is not possible, just put two or three of the materials together and look through. However, if the edge can come out and then give us advice, that would be appropriate. And... And this is what I've been saying. I'm sorry, I become so passionate about this. And it's fine. You must go on very, very well. Don't put okay. the mask below your nose. And don't put your, don't put the mask off when you are talking. And please, we should prevent ourselves from touching the mask. Mm. Once you sanitize your hands and then you put the mask on, you only touch the mask when your hands are sanitized again. And when okay. you put it off, you don't touch the face of the mask. You touch the side, the strap. That is when you move the mask. You burn it. And then please you wash your hands. Okay. I think CDC is doing a very good job because we have a video from one mm. organization showing that. Please, we must be careful with how we use the mask. Okay. However, we must use the mask. All right. Thank you so much. Sebastian Eugen Arthur is a virologist and he just uh, gave us some advice on the use of face mask in the country. Thank you for speaking to us. Anita, hmm. Hmm. what do you think? Interesting.
Interesting comments, especially about Guineans now starting to adapt to using the face mask. Yeah. It's going to be quite difficult, I should say. It would say. be. Very, very difficult. It would be. Now, I came across a, a story, um, I think it's about Rwanda and how they have extended uh, their lockdown as well, even at a, a certain number of cases. Mm -hmm. And so they have extended their partial lockdown as well. And they don't even have a thousand cases like us. They well, have yesterday, my Nigerian friends well. were like, what is happening in Ghana? I'm like, yeah. okay. Well, relax. Maybe gradually, if things start falling in place, we'll see, you know, or we'll see how everything goes. I mean, honestly, what I'm thinking is a few of the decisions that the president's made. I remember that we all came out and we were against it and then we yielded some results. And so he'll come back and say, well, you see, so it was good that some we made this decision. Some people think that this is so a let's little give it test. Time. Hmm. A little test to see how Ghanaians are self-disciplined. So basically, let's see how it goes. But let's be honest, Anita. We are not... <laughs> We are not. Bella. And you see, the fact mm. that we don't have our security personnel, that was at 6 a.m. when I was on my way well, here. this morning, I don't they, know about they this. are not around. They are not. The, as I was coming so to work. So that's the thing. Not even one. So how do we ensure social distancing? And everyone is just moving up and down, going about their normal duties. I came out uh, on the Chado, Burma camp, you know, trade fair area. And yeah. everything is back to normal. Hmm. Back to normal. People are still boarding the trotros and sitting like we used to sit. Yeah, I know. But anyways, uh, like Mr. Tommy Annan Forsen said, each one for himself, corona for us all. Please <laughs> be careful. It's important. But what are the numbers? Yeah, so as said yesterday, the 19th of April, like the president mentioned, we had collected some over 80,000 samples. And out of the 80,000, some 68,591 samples had been tested. Okay, so the breakdown is as follows. Let's take a look at Ghana's situation with team surveillance and one interesting part or, or interesting thing about this particular parameter or group is the fact that we've been able to get deaths in there critically ill or moderately ill well and responding to treatment recovered all these parameters have cases and so some 16,870 tests have been done with 383 confirmed cases. That is for Ghana's situation, the routine surveillance. Recovered, we have 99 well responding to treatment, 271 critical or moderately ill. We have four and then nine deaths. Now let's come to Ghana's situation, mandatory quarantine in Accra. In Accra, we've done some 2011 tests, with 105 of them testing positive for coronavirus. And when you look at Ghana's situation, mandatory quarantine in Tamale as well, we've done some 11 tests, and then now we have 11 cases out of Tamale, giving us a total of 2,020 tests for the mandatory quarantine, both in Accra and Tamale. Now, let's look at the aggressive testing or Ghana situation, enhanced contact tracing, which is actually giving us more positive cases so far. We have 544 confirmed cases. None of them has recovered. And I'm wondering what is being done so different from here that is not being done for the routine surveillance that we're having more recovered cases in there. Well, I'm responding to treatment still at 544. There's been a few changes on the Ghana Health Service website, and I think if you've been there constantly throughout this coronavirus pandemic, you'd realize that a lot has changed uh, these past few days, or from yesterday, I should say. When you come here, you see the total as 68,591, like I mentioned. Out of this, we have 1,042 tests. They are now giving us the positivity rate, just as the president made mention yesterday. Total number of positive for the routine surveillance, we have 383, which is 2 0.27%. Enhanced contact tracing, we have 544, which is 1.09%. And for the mandatory quarantine, both in Accra and Tamale, we have 115, which is 5.69%, and a total of 1.52. And now, this is quite interesting, and this should be something you should take a critical look at. Looking at the graph here, it gives you the number of reported cases on the left, and then date sample was taken. It starts from the 10th of March, as of 10th of March, Ghana had not recorded any case yet, which was good for us. But looking at how the graph has moved uh, sharply from the 10th of March, which was somewhere zero, and now they're giving us to um, zero, 200, to um, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, 1,200. That's the number of reported cases on the left. And so the graph keeps moving steadily, and you can see as of 15th March, we were still recording some cases, or a few cases, I should say. 20th March, the graph kept moving up steadily. And as at 19th April yesterday, we were above the 1,000 mark, which is 1,042 cases. So this should tell you that staying at home and taking all the precautionary measures serious is very important. It limits the spread as well. And when you look at this pie chart, 
the male or the number of uh, cumulative cases, you know, looking at the sexes, males, we have 60% females, 40%. That has quite been well established. And this particular graph as well, which has the percentage on the left and also age groups on the uh, lower bottom as well. Last week, the under 15, looking at the males and the females, they were at par at 50%. And if you take a critical look at the under 15 today, we have for the males going uh, lower and then the females going above 50%. That is a cause to worry because looking at the under 15 age group, that is an age group that we can confidently say that the immune system is quite strong. So what exactly is going wrong? Mm. 15 to 24, we also have the males going above 60 and the females on the rather 40 side, lower than 40. 25 to 34, that age group as well, we have more males above 60% and then females below 40%. 35 to 44, we have about 60%. And that should tell you that the males keep going high, which is, which, which is quite a worry for me. And for 45 to 59, still the males are leading with the females just below the 40 mark. And 60 plus, the males are still leading in that side. Also, there's another pie chart here, which I'm sure, like I keep mentioning, if you've been following this closely, you realize that it keeps changing. And for this particular one, as at last week, it was uh, travel of history and no tra travel history. But as at yesterday, after the update, we've now seen a little change, which is travel history not yet established, which is 82% and known travel history 18%. It's a little bit confusing as of now because initially it was no travel history. That is, we didn't know how they got it. Or we assumed that most of those cases in this percentage were as a result of community infections or community spread. And also the people under mandatory quarantine were the imported cases we had. But as of now, travel history not yet established, meaning that we still do not know how these 82% of the 1,042 got the coronavirus. And as for the known travel history, we've already established that they are imported cases. So we're yet to get more clarification on this particular parameter and then we know the way forward. Now let's look at the regional distribution. The numbers have changed. It keeps increasing and just as we have 1,042, definitely the numbers will change. Upper West has eight, Upper East eight. Northeast had one case as of last week. Now. It has another case, making it two. Northern had 10. Now it is at 11. The Ashanti region had, has had a few, like three cases more, and they are standing at 62. Eastern region, 51. Volta region had nine cases from last week. They have 10. Now Greater Accra region was a little above the 600 mark. Now still, you know, still standing as the epicenter in Ghana has 882 cases with central region recording seven. Central region has been at the one case mark for quite some weeks. Now it is at seven. Western is still at one. So Bella, hmm. this is serious. This, this is very serious. And it's more reason why we're drumming home, um, you know, the notion that you need to take care of yourself. At this point, you're not only taking care of yourself, but everybody else around you. It's very important. Now quickly, so the WHO just last week put out some six conditions for lifting the COVID-19 related restrictions in every country. I'll just read them to you before we go on break so you can give it some thought and let us know what you think. Now, condition number one says disease transmission should be under control. Two, health systems should be able to detect, test, isolate, isolate and treat every case and trace every contact. Three, hotspot risks are minimized in vulnerable places such as nursing homes. Four, schools, workplaces and other essential places have established preventive measures. Five, the risk of importing new cases can be managed. And six, communities are fully educated, engaged and empowered to live under a new normal. These are the six conditions that have been set by the WHO um, before you can lift any sort of restrictions that you have in your country. Have we met all these conditions hmm we're yet to find out yeah but this is still COVID 19 360 we're live on facebook you can share your thoughts and comment with us we're going for a quick commercial break when we come back there's more do stay Alrighty, welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360 and we've been speaking to a number of experts just to sample the opinion on the lifting of the lockdown and to one of the most uh, sought after segments on the show where we get to speak to Dr. Betha Sewa Ai, who is an infectious disease specialist and also Dr. Newman Arthur, who is a clinical psychologist. They join me at this point. Good morning and thank you so much for joining me. 
good, good morning, morning Bella. I want to find okay. out from both of you. Any of you can go first. What do you think about the president lifting the lockdown? Well, I, I'll start with Dr. Bertha Sewai because you have been advocating, actually, for a national lockdown. And now we see the president lifting the lockdown. Are you disappointed? Um, I think the, the word that describes how I felt was nervous. Mm. Tell me why. Nervous. Why were you nervous? Because um, we were using the term science and data. Mm -hmm. And like, I like to quote scripture, I'm sorry, but you know, the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, our scientists have done a study that shows that the virus has not changed its character or quality. Mm -hmm. The president mentioned in his speech that we have been able to sequence the virus. It is the same one that went to China. It is the same one that was in Italy and all these places. It has not changed. And when it shows up in Ghana, it hasn't even changed. And so I feel like we're looking at our current science to make future decisions. But in COVID-19, you look at future science decisions to make your current, um, I mean, you look at future projections to make your current decisions. Yeah. Ghana and most of Africa is exactly where Europe was on March 4th. You just go back and check. Mm. On March 4th, Europe had about 983 cases. Seven weeks later, they have over 1.2 million cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are also exactly where United States was on about March 16th or 15th. So America was lagging behind Europe by about 14 days. About March 14th, America recorded was about 283. And then I believe on March 17th, maybe we had a spike, but we went up to about 700. Now, this is exactly, March 14th is exactly five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. so five weeks later, America has gone from 283 to 800,000. Okay, this yeah. is five weeks. What it means is that to look at your current data of 1,042, and say that because you are 1,042, you think you're okay and the virus will suddenly change, I will not, um, I cannot support that, not because of any personal reasons, but it's just science. I mean, we go to school to be objective. I mean, at some point, you have to be objective. What this virus does is, and, and it is why President Trump on one minute, we'll be writing a letter to President Xi and saying, good job, good job, keep the virus in China. Because at that time, he didn't know that 283 cases on March 14th mm -hmm. is going to become 800,000 five weeks, five weeks later. And we're talking about just, today is April 20th. Yes. So I'm talking about exactly, six, no, well, 20 plus, 20, yeah, exactly 40 days later, America has recorded 800,000 mm -hmm. from 283. So you cannot look at the 1,042 cases and say we're fine. No, the virus has not changed. If you give it the opportunity, you would hit 800,000. The only good thing I can say is that we're going a little above and beyond in terms of testing. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the lockdown, I always say, it's not a cure. The lockdown just gives you time so that it's like an army comes to you. You have an army of a thousand people. They all have swords and they're fighting. When you do a lockdown, it's like you are condoning maybe 900 of the army. You are tying their arms literally so they can move mm -hmm. so that you fight the hundred. And you're hoping that by the time you get rid of the hundred, the 900 people are so weak, they can't fight. So you win the fight. The lockdown just does, that, does just that. It doesn't suddenly kill all your thousand. So when you lift the lockdown and you say, okay, I'm still going to attack the hundred, you've empowered the rest of the virus. What, what removing the lockdown literally means is that anybody who has been incubating the disease over the last 14 days, mm -hmm. they're going to start manifesting. We say they should come out and spread and go to our markets and do everything else. And so I think that we're entering a social experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, We've done well, let's put it objectively. Not many countries have gone on lockdown. 
It was Rwanda, Nigeria, yeah. South Africa, and a few. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is people haven't gone on lockdown because their numbers are 80. If you look around Africa, Egypt, um, um, South Africa South is Africa. around 3,000. Yeah. Algeria is around 1,200 or so. We are like number five. But what it means is, I keep saying this, you don't look at your current numbers. And we have too much history. We have China, we have Italy, we have America. You all saw what happened. And it doesn't take a year. Within six weeks, you would see. So I suppose, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a decision maker. All I would say, this is an experiment. Let's see what's going to happen over the next six weeks. If the virus is truly going to behave like it did in Europe, mm -hmm. and we are just seven weeks and five weeks behind United States of America, what, which is why, yes, if you look at the current situation, it makes perfect sense. But if you look at what it does, you study countries, you study the projection, yeah. then you realize it's just like you have a hurricane coming. At the time you're going to make a decision, you don't have a hurricane, but you know it's going to come. So you prepare. But if you say that, well, mm. I don't feel any wind. Yeah. I don't feel any strong anything. Besides, I don't even live near the coast. You can give all sorts of excuses. But yesterday I was watching CNN. One of the people in New York, I think it was one of the doctors, he said, look, this thing hit us fast and furious. When it hits, it will hit fast and furious. So for me as a scientist, I can only warn. I don't have okay. any... Um, ties or personal relationships to anybody, so I can give an objective analysis, and okay. that's just my thought. It makes All right. me nervous. Let, let me bring Dr. Newman in because at this point, it looks like people are a bit confused. As much as we're seeing numbers, uh, you know, scores of people out there going about their business, there's still a chunk of us that are confused. We don't know whether to step out, whether to stay in, because we're not sure what's going to happen. What do you make of that mental state that we find ourselves in? Dr. Newman, can you hear me? Dr. Newman? Okay, I'll come back to Dr. Bertha then. Because, you know, you mentioned um, that, you know, the lockdown doesn't necessarily cure the, the problem. It only controls the spread. But testing is what really does the magic. And again, like uh, the president mentioned, we're the number one country in Africa that's done more tests per million. And so then if we're releasing people to go out there and contact tracing is still ongoing actively, then that should still give us the results that we require without necessarily spreading it, no? Um, not exactly. See, if you look uh, at the data that you, um, you presented oh. earlier. Dr. Newman, I'll um, come to you shortly. The, enhanced, the okay. enhanced surveillance did pick up a number of people. I think it was maybe, is it 1.2% or whatever that number yeah. was? Now, the enhanced surveillance was testing the contacts of the contacts. Now, our routine surveillance also picked up some people. So the point is that when you do a lockdown, you're almost, like I said, holding the army down while you gain control of the ones that are out there in the loose. And okay. I understand. I'm sure the decision was based on people live on a daily income. They mm -hmm. shop on a daily basis. Yeah. It's hard to get them food. And I'm sure even based on the government budget, it was hard to probably meet all the food promises and the pressure, mm -hmm. pressure. People don't have money. How are they going to pay this? How are they going? So, I mean, I can understand the difficulty the administration must be in, especially when you haven't hit that peak, that, you know what, you have to make some kind of a, a dis and it's the same pressure everybody's facing everywhere. America, Europe, they're all under pressure. I mean, one minute Donald Trump says, you know what, I think I'm going we're going to gonna open by yeah. the end. And then the scientists will tell him, you don't make that decision. The virus will tell you when you can. Um, the good thing about UK is that at least um, the prime minister had to be ill. Mm -hmm. And now you can see that they're extending their lockdown because he's felt it in his body. And sometimes we say, oh, only nine people have died. Well, only nine is 0 0.86 percent. It comes down to the one percent we know everywhere. So even our number of deaths, it still confirms the fact that this virus is the same everywhere. It doesn't mm. make ours any different. Okay. And sometimes when you look at the individual numbers, it can deceive you. When those nine people include the rector of your college of physicians, 
Mm. In Nigeria, it was a right hand man of the of president. the president. Yeah. In in Iran, is a right hand man of Ayatollah. It makes you put it into perspective. Okay, let, let, me, let me come back to Dr. Newman to answer the question about the mental state that people find themselves in. Because like I said, as much as we have many people out there, yeah. there are still people who are confused. Some don't even know whether to go to work or not because they are not sure if they are safe. Others are not sure if they can step out and go about their normal duties, even though the president has eased the restrictions. What do you make of it? Yeah, I think that generally uh, when people see that there's an improvement in the situation, and there's, there's a, a relief of lockdown, then they, they will become a bit uh, uh, positive about uh, what, what is going on. But now we know it's jumped to 1,042. Then there is a lift of lockdown. So people actually are anxious about what to do and whether they should, they should stay home or they should go to work. Or This morning someone called me and was saying that he's scared to step out because it's now 1,042. When it was around in, in, the, in the tents, we, we, we locked down. Now it's in the thousands, and we, we, open, we said mm -hmm. everybody could go out. So people are actually anxious, and they don't even know what to do again. Because someone called me this morning and said he's, he's anxious, he's afraid to step out. He doesn't know what to do, right? And also, if you look at the response of people to the lift of lockdown, you see people were jumping in town, going about all kinds of things in town. So it's like now people are even the precaution uh, that the precautions that were put there for people to follow, it is not like that anymore. Because it's actually very difficult to control human behavior. Mm. One of the most uh, difficult things to control is human behavior, especially in, in a diverse society where people do what they like. You know, it, it is very, very difficult. Look at even common malaria, we still struggle with common malaria. Now, I know in the northern region, you know, CSF uh, has gone up. It's also, you know, yeah, and, and, in the upper west. People are yeah. dying. Mm. You know, all kinds of things. Cholera, even at this point, we still struggle with con containing cholera and controlling cholera. It's human behavior. So the lockdown is meant to put all of us in check so that people don't do what they like, especially in this season. So okay. if we all saw the numbers coming down and there was a lift of lockdown, then people would be quite happy that at least we've seen progress and this has become less issue. But okay. if we are going up and we have to, we have to lift it, then uh, people will be scared. But, Actually, but, I, I, I was a bit anxious yesterday. What, what happens to employers? Um, so if I work for someone, as an employer, I mean, I'm talking about the other person, as an employer, what are they supposed to do yes. to ensure my safety? Because I can decide not to go to work if I'm not convinced that the working environment is safe. And I believe that I have every... Uh, right, maybe I'm not sure legal, but every other right to ensure that my safety comes first as well. Uh, well, at this point, every every uh, employer will be, will be concerned because, for example, if you work in a certain environment, you have about uh, 500 people, 200 people, or 100 people, or even 50 people coming to work every day. You are going to be concerned because one person who may have it spends the whole day with everybody else in one office. The likelihood that they're going to spread it is very high. So employers are going to be worried. You know, there was an incident where a, a, a company had one person test positive and the person had been to work for a day or two and everybody was panicking. And even the workers were really angry that uh, uh, something like that could happen. So there will be anger, there will be confusion. People will be very, very anxious. When people come to work, they don't even know who to, who to be around with and that kind of thing. This is going to be the actual situation at, in a working environment. Mm -hmm. And if an employee says, I will not come to work because I want to be safe, how do you sack that employee? So very, very difficult. So what okay. I would advise is that the general precautionary, uh, the precautionary measures, we should keep you know, putting those things in place. And let's trust and hope that this decision, this decision will turn out to be a good one. Okay, Dr. Bertha, 99 people have recovered currently in Ghana. The question that's lingering in the minds of people. So, I mean, of course, like you have explained to us, the virus doesn't entirely leave the body. It just becomes very dormant because your immune system is able to fight it. But what, what are some of the things that could lead to a recovered patient contracting the virus again or having the virus resurface um, in his body or her body? Um, I don't think it will be a new contracting of the virus versus it expressing itself in an area where a swab or a culture would show it positive. Mm. Um, and there's a lot we have to learn about this virus because um, the learning from Ebola 
I mean, it even continues at this point. They're still tracking patients with Ebola to detect which tissues have it, which tissues don't have it. Even the antibodies, as of this time, the whole world, scientific world, doesn't know what those antibodies mean. Does that mean the person would never get it again? Does that mean next year, if this virus would come back in the same full force, those who were infected would not will be able to survive it? We mm. really do not know. And that's just the truth of it. We don't know what that antibody is. It, is it an immunity? Mm. Because, you know, there are viruses where you get it once and you never get it again. You know, like chicken pox and measles. You're never going to get it again. Okay. And then there are others like norovirus where you can get it 20 times. Mm. You don't build any immunity. Any antibody doesn't mean anything. Um, even HIV. There are people who will test positive for HIV. They are taking medications and they keep having relationships with other people. They can acquire new viruses. And if you do the genetic profile, you can see they've acquired a resistant virus from somebody. So at this point, we all don't even know what those antibodies mean, whether it's immunity, whether it's just a transient um, serology or what. Even patients with hepatitis C, after they get cured, they can acquire a new infection if they go and inject drugs again. So um, that's just my take on that. Okay. Now the conditions set by the WHO, there are six of them. And those are the conditions that countries and heads of states should consider before lifting a lockdown or easing the restrictions in their various countries. I I'm sure that you've been able to go through it, but just in case you haven't, disease transmission under control, health systems should be able to detect, test, isolate, and treat every case and trace every contact. Hotspots risk should be minimized in vulnerable places such as nursing homes, etc. Schools, workplaces, and other essential places should have established preventive measures. The risk of important new cases should be able to be managed and communities uh, should be fully educated, engaged, and empowered to live under a new normal. I'll come to you, Dr. Betha, but first of all, Dr. Numian, have we been able to meet these conditions um, in, in your opinion? Yeah, I think some of them. Uh, I think there's pointer two and three, or, or the testing and all that. Mm -hmm. But the, I think the last part about education and all that, I exactly. think that we, we still, there, there's still a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do in that area. Because how can people be jubilating and running you know, on the streets last night? <laughs> it shows they don't really understand what, yeah. what is going on. So I think that bit, and at this point, that is the only thing we have now, <laughs> to educate them and to hope that they will do the right thing. Mm. You know? okay. And so that, that, is, that is what, because now it's like everybody is on, on their own and what they do matters. And it will be dependent on the kind of information they have and their, com their commitment to making sure that whatever information they get, they put it to use. Okay. And so uh, that bit is, is what, what, what we are left with eventually uh, mm. now. Okay, Dr. Bertha, what, do you share the same sentiments? Well, I think that number four and five, we've got a down path, which mm. is um, importation of cases that we took care of it. Um, yeah. We took care of it um, in the middle of March. And in terms of churches, Schools, schools, workplaces, schools yeah. and churches are out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so we pretty much know that we've taken care of four and five. Mm. Number five, we barely scratched the surface. I was happy when last week the Minister of Information was talking about how during the live um, Ministry of Information briefing, they brought in the journalists, the media houses, telling everybody to spend more time on COVID-19. They've engaged the Department of Linguistics at Ligon, so that more pamphlets, I think we barely, so far as the English, people who can understand English is, are concerned, I think we've done a good work. Most people get it. But those people who we really want the message to get to the fishermen, the people who are selling in the markets, who don't even watch radio, can't understand what we say, we barely scratch the surface. Because if you interview them, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, People are still extremely misinformed. And if we could do like a strong two-week target, 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 and actually get feedback that shows that people, because when, when, when the WHO visited China, what they found amazing was they saw people behind their windows. They were standing there. They were looking, but they were not stepping out. It means you have a very highly disciplined people. I don't think we're, because they understood what was going on. Mm. We don't understand it. 
Like Florida, they said the beaches are open. That's like craziness in the middle of an outbreak. The beaches are open. I mean, yeah. clearly there's something, there's some mismatch. So until we could get the message to them, then we can do that decision of, we, we, we haven't met number five. That's number six. That's for sure. Yeah. Number one, two, and three is debatable. Are mm. we, are, do we have the capacity to pick every new case? I think we the, the, the new um, app that we launched is mm. useful. It's picking up symptoms. Okay. But until, you know, in, in Taiwan and Singapore, they had the software that was tracking like everybody. And they were picking, even Singapore two days ago, mm. they suddenly had a set, in spite of all their software. So we have to be extremely careful. I think we've met four and five. One, two, three, and six, we haven't completely done that. Okay. I still applaud the expanded testing, though. All right. Thank you so much. And again, for those of you who um, wanted some clar clarification, pardon me, on how you can also support uh, the Africa CDC in, with some PPEs, like Dr. Bertha said, uh, so they can send you an email, right, Dr. Bertha? Yes. Okay, so it's sewabb at gmail.com. Yes. Okay, so all designers who are interested in sewing some PPEs that can be purchased by the Africa Center for Disease Control to support health workers all across the continent, you can send Dr. Bertha Sewa a mail. And if you want the exact spelling, you can check my Instagram page. I posted that over the weekend, and so you can grab the email address and send to it. Thank you so much. Dr. Bertha Sewa, i.e., is an infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist. And we're looking forward to spending the rest of the week with both of you on air. And so we'll see you tomorrow, God willing. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Okay, we'll be back. It's COVID-19 360. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to read some messages on COVID-19 360 and we'll speak to someone that has saved a lot of us Lives, exactly. on the continent. Yeah. Well, this one says, good morning, Bella and Anita. Lifting the ban now came as a surprise to some of us, especially in the public sector. It's not everybody for himself. Has the escaped Guinean woman been found? Well, we're yet to be updated on that particular issue. But the last time I checked, she was still on the run. Hello, Anita and Bella. Good morning. Please, I want to ask, is the number of people who have recovered from the virus subtracted from the total confirmed cases or they're still added? I do not understand that one. Please, can I be enlightened? Well, deaths, recovered cases, critically ill, moderately ill, everybody, everything sums up to give us the total of 1,042 cases. So nothing has been subtracted. Everything sums up to the total number. This one says, as a public servant, the economic devastation of this virus thing dumps my spirit. But if you are educated, Please educate the uneducated about this COVID-19. This is coming from Adnan in Tamale. And this one says, may I know the current COVID-19 data? Well, we updated you earlier on, but we'll be doing that subsequently as well. This one says, Bella, I've been reading tons of articles ever since the outbreak of the pandemic. But I read a very interesting one recently, which indicated that scientists have discovered that farting can actually spread the virus. Oh, yes. Yeah. Please let the doctors confirm I, this for me. I oh. actually read that too. Yes, that's true. I've been wanting to ask Dr. Bertha. I don't know. It keeps escaping me. But this is something that's been going around for about two weeks now. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good morning, TV3. Please tell His Excellency the President about we, the casual workers in the various hospitals, about our fate with regard to the COVID-19. We are not on government payroll, so what would the President do for us? We're also dealing directly to clients or patients at the various hospitals and health centers in the country. This is from Abdul Wasab Saeed from Tamale. I respect Dr. Selwa's opinion on the decision, but with the timing of US and UK and all other countries, Yes, the virus is the same, but were the measures put in place the same? Remember UK and US were opened to people coming into uh, their countries without border closure. How about that comparison to Ghana? Wow, and this one finally says, hello, Sister Anita, why did the president lift the lockdown? Well, that one. Mm, <laughs> interesting. Anyway, well, okay. We have, mm -hmm. we have one more comment. Let's just quickly okay, read this that. Okay, this says, good morning, Anita and Bella. If I understand the mode of transmission of the virus very well, one can only contract it by droplets getting through the nose and mouth. I think the use of the nose mask is very necessary and should be made compulsory once we cannot continue with the lockdown. This is from Gilbert Iruzi from Uwa. The president should be frank. Uh, he lifted the partial lockdown because he doesn't have the resources to continue with the lockdown. Wow. 
We know how to treat coronavirus, but we don't know how to treat hunger virus in this sick economy. This is from Bad Gamble by the president. Wow, interesting mm. comments, I should say. Definitely. Now, we've been asking for you to keep washing your hands at least 25 times a day if you have the opportunity. Also, keep your hand sanitizer. Now, one thing that's become very popular over the period of coronavirus is the use of the Veronica buckets. Whereas people have bought it to use at home, we've seen a lot of donations to market centers, to public places where Veronica buckets were included. Now, we have the pioneer of Veronica buckets, the woman behind, um, you know, the, the, the invention, if I could say. And she was a biological scientist at... Uh, a public health and reference lab at the Ghana Health Service. This was from 1972 to 2008, during which she came up with the idea to use Veronica buckets just to prevent infections in the lab. Eventually, uh, we adopted it to fight cholera and a few other diseases as well. And today we get to speak to her. Good morning, ma'am, and thank you so much for speaking to us. I hope you're well. Yes, I am, Bella. Good morning to you, too. Good morning, and it's good to have you on the show. Now, first of all, I want to find out how it feels like knowing that at this crucial time where we are advocating for people to keep washing their hands, it's the Veronica bucket uh, that seems the most popular and a better choice for people to use um, to wash their hands. Well, it feels good because, like you know, uh, I came up with this in about 30 years ago, and it has been dormant. Mm. It was only the advent of COVID-19 that brought it to the limelight. So I feel good and yeah. happy that uh, it, it, it's serving its purpose. Now, I know that at the time when you came up with this idea, it was in the lab where you were looking at finding a solution to preventing um, some infections in the lab. Now, tell me, how successful was this during that time? And what's that moment where you realized, okay, this is really working and I'm happy about it? Tell us about the Eureka moment as well. Okay. It was successful in the sense that I was asked to do, like you rightly said, some work on infection prevention in the laboratories. Because, like you know, we deal with people who are sick. Like the laboratory investigations, the samples will deal with uh, presumably contain some bacteria or some viruses or whatever. Mm. So in handling th those um, samples, we get our hands contaminated. And uh, for infection prevention, hand washing is the most si single effective way of preventing infection. Mm. And uh, I went around to look at the way my colleagues were washing their hands in the labs. Mm. And uh, yeah. As we have the problem now, I realized that in laboratories where they didn't have running water from the taps, they were using bowls or buckets with stagnant water mm -hmm. to wash their hands, which wasn't good enough. Because that water is only good the very first time somebody washes his or her hand in it. Mm. But if that water is not thrown away, any subsequent washing is rather, you are rather contaminating your hands instead of getting your hands clean. Yeah. So that was what motivated me to find ways and means of providing running water for use in the laboratories. Oh, okay. And uh, it caught on quite well because they, they realized the wisdom in it and the fact that it would help them to prevent infecting themselves and even their families mm -hmm. and the patients that we were dealing with. That's, that's good to know. You said it's been, what, 13 years since your invention came 30, to life? 30, 30 years. 19, yes, 30 years. 92, wow. I've been quiet. You know, it's known, it was then known only in the laboratories and the health facilities mm. because that, that, that was the main objective to prevent infection and control infection in the health sector. So, so has this idea been patented? No, it has not. I, I attempted to patent it, mm. but uh, I was frustrated by the bureaucracy and uh, I gave it up at a point, which I so much regret now. I can imagine. So that means that at this point, I mean, as much as you may have looked for a solution for your colleagues, now the entire country has adopted it. Other countries in Africa have adopted it as well. Does yes. it mean that you are not getting any benefits from it? Financially? No, 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 not at all. No. You said you regret it. Tell me why. Because if I had patented it, and the other thing too is, 
does patenting work in Ghana or in Africa at large? I don't know. Mm. But maybe if I had patented it, I, I would have the copyright and uh, anybody who attempts to do same will have to pay me some royalty or something. Definitely. So that is why... I believe it's not too late at this point. Would you still go ahead if you have the chance? Yes, I'm trying to see if it is possible at this point to do something about it. Is it more about benefiting from it financially or is it about cementing your legacy in terms of wanting cementing to pay? Cementing my legacy. Okay. Cementing my legacy because, you know, like I said, I, I mm. didn't come up with this thing for a, a financial gain. It's mm. just to help out to control infection. So it's more of cementing my legacy rather than financial gain. But, but I mean, at this point, everybody attributes the Veronica bucket to you. Um, once you see that particular bucket with the tap, everybody says that, oh, that's the Veronica bucket. Is that not enough? Well, I don't know. It, it, it gives me some satisfaction. Yeah. But if I look at the you know, amount of money other people are making mm -hmm. out of it, you know, it, 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 it hurts a bit. That, yeah. That, that's about it. I can imagine. But ma'am, tell us how you've been managing. I mean, now the lockdown has been lifted, but all this while when we're under partial lockdown, how are you managing, especially because you are also older? And initially the belief was that the elderly were vulnerable. Now we do understand that even young people can catch the virus yes. and also yes. suffer from it. But how have you been managing? Well, I'm, I've been managing quite well because by nature, mm. I'm not supposed to go out much. So it, it, the lockdown didn't really affect me. Mm. If I needed to buy some food or medication, I go out and I didn't have any trouble from the security personnel. Mm. But by and large, I stayed at home. Yeah, and I hope that you continue to stay safe. But a quick advice yes. to everyone watching you at this point. We're advocating, we're encouraging people to wash their hands and do everything they need to do, social distancing and all of that. Now that the lockdown has been lifted, what advice would you give to people knowing very well what you may have experienced whilst working in the lab? Yes, my advice is, yes, the president has lifted or relaxed the lockdown. But it doesn't mean we should go back to our old ways. Mm. We should continue to obey all the directives, social distancing, washing our hands as frequently as possible, wearing the mask when you are going out. You know, we, we, we should behave ourselves. Yeah. We are in really difficult and abnormal times. And if we don't take it, if we go back to our old ways, we'll land ourselves into big big trouble so i'm feeling appealing to everybody to still to be conscious of the fact that covid 19 is still around mm -hmm. and uh, we should learn yeah. to comply to the directives all right thank you so much madame veronica bakui yes. is uh, the inventor of the veronica bucket between 1972 and 2008 she worked as a biological scientist at the public health and reference laboratory at the ghana health service thank you for speaking to us we'll be back it's covid 19 360. thank you for inviting me back anita is a very bad person <laughs> Anyway, so um, I hope that you enjoyed today's edition of COVID-19 360. Anita has a little message for you before we go. Yes. Don't you? Okay, no problem. Freedom gloves. Now I'm sorry, AP, now we call the nam and now now for whom I'm changing and then they never be strong about back to back to Dabi. It's not fair. Now both who buy and both who buy for who buy. And now so 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 can we have who run sa fast semina ye. Now both who buy who run sa fast semina ye. Anyway, happy birthday to Thierry Nyan. Yes, happy birthday to Thierry Nyan of the sports yeah. department. Yeah, yes. we had another name, but we didn't hear as well. So you happy birthday anyway. <laughs> and thank you for watching. We'll see you all tomorrow.